Dubliners, a portrait of the artist as a young man, exiles, Ulysses, Finnegan's Wake. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things is Joyce's forgotten work. Written between the time of 1914-1915 and published in 1918, Exiles has the unfortunate honor of being written between two pillars of not only Irish literature, but of Western literature in general, that being A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and Ulysses. Exiles is the go-between. It's the one people have forgotten. But in this video, I want to explore whether or not Exiles was forgotten for justifiable reasons, such as not adding up to his other works, or whether or not that there's tragedy in the fact that Exile is, over is now overlooked by scholars and, you know, common readers alike. I'm Matt from Matt's Bookshelf, and today I'm talking about James Joyce's only published play, and that is Exiles. Like A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, you can probably safely bet that this play is somewhat autobiographical. But whereas Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man was very much Joyce writing retrospectively about his own life, one could see Exiles as sort of speculative on Joyce's part. The main character of Exiles is a writer named Richard who, along with his girlfriend, Bertha, lived in Ireland but then departed to Rome so that Richard could find more artistic fulfillment in his writing, only to return home at the start of this play. Joyce follows a very similar route as he departed Ireland with his girlfriend and later wife, Dora, so that he could be fulfilled creative, creatively, only to return to Ireland on the separate occasions, try to get his books published, and eventually disillusioned and seeing that Ireland has not changed in a way that he would have liked, and then subsequently return back to other European countries, to the European mainland, if you will. The other main characters of this play are Archie, who is Bertha and Richard's illegitimate child. There's an old lover of Richard, who is Beatrice Justice, who, at the start of the play, comes to visit Richard for the first time. And there's also Beatrice's cousin, Robert, who is a journalist, potential lover of his cousin Beatrice, and also a very old friend of Richard. This is James Joyce's only published play and play that's still in existence, and is heavy, heavily inspired by modernist trends at the time mainly in the works of the father of realism and the man who spearheaded the modernist movement in theater, and that is Henrik Johan Ibsen. Ibsen is a Norwegian playwright and probably one of the most famous playwrights in Western literature, and Joyce himself has admitted to being heavily inspired by Ibsen, but literary critics at the time said that inspiration probably went a little overboard and, you know, called Exiles a ripoff of an Ibsen play. To first understand Exiles, I think it's first necessary to understand Ibsen and the modernist play as a whole. Ibsen's work focuses on real-life people fighting real-life struggles of an overbearing society and a sort of disillusionment with societal ideals that are, you know, traditional and propped up. For example, there's Doll's House, which is the only play by Ibsen that I've read and probably his most famous play, which falls on a Norwegian woman named Nora who, under her husband Torvald's name, takes it alone so that her husband, who was sick at the time, can go on a trip to Italy for health reasons. Of course, in Norway at the time, take a woman taking out a loan was illegal, and the basis conflict of this play is Nora trying to cover up, is Nora trying to work off the loan secretly on her own, while also trying to keep her, her illegal activities secret from other men who are, you know, becoming more aware of what she has done and facing the societal pressures from friends and from Torvald who feels like his masculinity has been insulted by her actions while also facing legal re the real life legal repercussions. Exiles follows very similar themes where it's sort of the deconstruction of a healthy relationship. There are attempts to stay true to the ideal, strong, in this case, Christian relationship, but as the play goes on, you'll see that the actual fibers that are holding these relationships together are actually very, very weak. Richard stands out as arguably the main character of Exiles. As I said, he's very much a mirror of Joyce at this time in his life. He's a writer, lived in Ireland, fled to Italy for creative purposes with his girlfriend slash wife, had children in case, in this case, Joyce had two children and um, Richard and Bertha only had one child and Archie came back to Ireland only to be further disillusioned. And it also weirdly works as a sequel to Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, 
because Stephen Dedalus in Portrait, his story ends with him deciding to leave Ireland for Italy. And in this story, it's Richard coming from Ireland, coming from Italy, and back to Ireland. And the play starts off with Beatrice Justice, who is an old lover of Richard, coming to visit him in his home in Dublin. And through their dialogue, you understand that there's a history between them, that they at one point they were lovers, and there's sort of this openness to maybe rekindle this relationship, even though Richard's already in a relationship as it is. Also during this conversation, we realize that Richard has a mother who has recently passed away, and through their dialogue, you understand that he has a very estranged relationship with his mother, and that while she was dying, he did not go to visit her. During this conversation, Richard says, She drove me away. On account of her, I lived years in exile and poverty too, or near it. I never accepted the doles she sent me through the bank. I waited too, not for her death, but for some understanding of me, her own son, her own flesh and blood that never can. Not even after Archie? My son, you think? A child of sin and shame? Are you serious? There were tongues here ready to tell her all. To embitter her withering mind still more against me and birth than our godless nameless child. Can you not hear her mocking me while I speak? You must know the voice, surely, the voice that called you black Protestant, the pervert's daughter. In any case, a remarkable woman. So not only do you get a glimpse into the relationship between Richard and her mother, or lack thereof by that matter, but also the the prejudice against Beatrice, who is Protestant. And obviously going with the ties of Irish nationalism, where most of the Irish nationalists were Catholics, while the British oppressors, if you will, were Protestant. So there is a clear indication that Richard's mother is maybe an Irish nationalist as well. And that Beatrice, whether, you know, regardless of how faithful she is to her faith, is probably looked at as being different because of her faith. Because she's not Catholic, she's probably not being viewed as a real Irish person. Speaking of Irish nationalists, Robert... Edmund enters the scene next. Robert is the old friend of Richard. He's currently a journalist and has lived his whole life in Ireland. He is an Irish nationalist, and his character draws a very similar comparisons to the character of Lynch in A Portrait of the Artist's Young Man, who, if you don't know, was the character that Stephen speaks to towards the end of the book, an old friend of Stephen, who tries to persuade Stephen to sing to Ireland, to fight for Ireland, to fight for Irish nationalism, and take Britain out of Ireland. And they sort of have a conflict where... Lynch doesn't see the value in selfishness or selfish artistic pursuits, whereas Stephen doesn't see any value in fighting for a pointless cause in you know, these Irish revolutions that typically, at this at least at this point in time, never really amounted to much success. Richard, not wanting to deal with Robert, escapes to the garden, leaving Beatrice alone with her cousin. From there, Robert and Beatrice have somewhat of a strange talk until, that is, Archie and Bertha come to the scene. From there, Beatrice and Archie break off to do Archie's piano lessons as Beatrice is Archie's piano teacher, leaving Robert and Bertha alone to talk. Robert flirts with Bertha almost immediately, calling her beautiful and distant like the moon or a deep song, as he says. Bertha is not opposed to these flirtations, and as the scene goes on, and as Robert's advances become more intimate, he allows him to kiss and hold her during the scene. Robert claims that he has come with a job offer for Richard, at his publication. He urges Bertha to convince Richard to take the job for both of their happinesses, but makes a specific emphasis that Bertha will be happier if Richard takes the job and settles down in Dublin. So here you get the central conflict of exiles and that being Robert's pursuit of Bertha, despite the fact that Bertha wants to be in a relationship with Richard. And one would think that the central plot would involve Bertha sort of trying to keep the relationship under wraps, but that is not the case because literally Robert leaves and in the same scene as Richard enters, Bertha confesses to Richard of Robert's advances and fortunately for Bertha, Richard really does not act in the way that she plans. When Bertha confronts Richard with Robert's feelings for her, Richard responds with indifference. Throughout the scene, Bertha tries to provoke Richard into some sort of reaction. She wants him to get mad. She wants him to defend her in some way to, or at least call out Robert on his acts. Just, and it's some sort of attempt to uphold the sanctity of their relationship. She thinks that if 
Richard responds hostily to this, or or some sort of defiance at all to this, that it means that he cares for her and that the relationship has some sort of being to it. But Richard does not give her that. He he tells her to decide on her own. He says he gives her the liberty to make her decision for her, but to make the decision for herself. But Bertha does not want this. She wants Richard to tell her what to do. Although it's very mysterious right now, it, the, the actual revelation as to why this indifference is here is going to be revealed later on in Act 2. And in all honesty, I don't think that Bertha is confessing Robert's advances out of some sort of guilt. I think that she refuses liberty, and I think that her reason for refusing liberty is because she literally wants to be told what to do. It may not be so much that she wants Richard to say no, but she just wants direction because she accepts Robert's advances. So she's not repulsed by Robert. And you'll see this in later scenes that she, you know, is very welcoming to Robert. But honestly, I think that if Robert, if Richard told her to go for it, then she'd be just as fine as if he said no. Bertha wants Richard to tell her what to do, but instead Richard gives her autonomy, which is the absolute last thing that Bertha wants in this situation. Act 2 begins in Robert's cottage. He's sitting alone by his piano when there's a knock on the door. He exclaims Bertha in this moment, expecting Bertha to be at the door, but when he opens it, it's actually Richard. The two sit down, and they reminisce about their friendship, but eventually, Richard brings up what Bertha has told him. Robert insists that his actions toward Bertha were just a moment of weakness, and that it, he is happy that Richard has called him out on his duplicity because it means he'll never do it again. However, Richard doesn't tell him not to do it again. He instead sort of analyzes and asks questions of Robert and, you know, his motivations like a psychologist would, clearly detached from the situation that's going on, and the fact that he's pursuing the mother of this child. It is here that Robert reveals some of his thoughts and feelings on morality and sin, and how in his mind, only having a sexual relationship with one woman goes against God's design of human nature. In this passage he says, I feel in my heart something different. I believe that on the last day, if it ever comes, when we are assembled together, that the Almighty will speak to us like this. We will say that we live chastely with one another. Lie to him, or that we tried. And he will say to us, fools, who told you that you were to give yourself to one being only? You were made to give yourself to many freely. I wrote that law with my finger on your heart. This draws obvious parallels to Joyce's criticism of the Catholic Church's teachings on chastity in Portrait of the Arts as a Young Man. Specifically, when Stephen Dedalus decides to live a more chaste life, he has to physically cripple himself from the rest of the world in order to get rid of temptation from this life. But even then, as he, you know, when he's walking, he's looking down, he's not looking at anyone, he's subjecting himself to horrible smells and tastes for the penance of it. But even with that said, the, the, the feelings of lust and temptation still linger and are inescapable. And same thing with Robert here, just to a more extreme. But in contrast to Robert's looser morals, Richard feels incredibly guilty for his past, mainly in his unfaithfulness to Bertha while they were abroad in Italy. He says that because he ruined like the sanctity of their relationship, that he somehow ruined Bertha and her purity. He has sort of cruelly taken away Bertha's innocence in this regard, which is more in line with Catholic teachings on chastity. And this sort of brings new light into Richard's indifference to Bertha's pursuit of relationship with Robert. This can maybe be seen as penance on his part, you know, sort of seeking forgiveness for her sins. He cheated on Bertha, so now he thinks that in order to be redeemed in some sort of way, or in order to, in order for Bertha to get some sort of vindication in their relationship, even though she probably isn't aware of, of his unfaithfulness, that she can cheat on Robert. And that is somehow a, a fitting punishment for Richard's sins of unfaithfulness. On this topic, Richard says, Listen, she is dead. She lies in my bed. I look at her body, which I betrayed grossly and many times, and loved to and wept over. I know that her body was always my loyal slave. To me only she gave. Do not suffer, Richard. There is no need. She's loyal to you, body and soul. Why do you fear? Not that fear, but that I will reproach myself then for having taken all from myself because I would not suffer her to give to another what was hers and not mine to give. Because I accepted from her her loyalty and made her life poorer in love. That is my fear, that I stand between her in any moments of life that should be hers. Between her and you, between her and anyone, between her and anything, 
I will not do it. I cannot, and I will not. I dare not. From there, Robert and Richard return back to Richard's estate, and it is this point that Richard solidifies his autonomy for Bertha by leaving both her and Robert alone in, their, in his estate. It is during this conversation with Bertha that Robert admits his jealousy towards Richard and that he recalls the moment where he and Richard first met Bertha and knew in that moment that Bertha was in love with Richard and not him. He admits that when Richard first wanted to leave to Italy that he tried to convince him to let Bertha stay. Bertha insists that he was doing it out of both of their happinesses, but Robert completely rejects that and says that he only did it for selfish reasons. And there's obvious resentment here for Richard, both in his relationship with Bertha, Bertha's desire in him instead of Robert, and in Richard's choice to leave Ireland during, you know, tumultuous political times. From here, Robert makes his advances on Bertha. He holds her and strokes her hair and tells her to say that she loves him. Bertha does not do this. Instead, she says that he likes, instead she says that she likes Robert and thinks that she's a good man. Robert then asks if Bertha loves both he and Richard alike, to which Bertha does not respond at all, leaving the second act in a state of ambiguity. Before we get into the third act, it is necessary to discuss deeper into the character of Robert, mainly in how he tries to uphold his friendship with Richard while also pursuing Richard's girlfriend and the mother of his child, Bertha. Basically, Robert is a man driven by human instinct and passion and thinks that all things else, whether it be morals, friendships, relationships, what have you, are subsequent to human passion. When talking with Richard and about the conflict that they face regarding Bertha, Robert says this, A battle of both our souls, different as they are, against all that is false in them and in the world. A battle of your soul against the specter of fidelity, of mine against the specter of friendship. All life is conquest, the victory of human passion over the commandments of cowardice. Will you, Richard, have you the courage, even if it shatters to atoms the friendship between us, even if it breaks up forever the last illusion of your own life? There was an eternity before we were born, another will come after we are dead. The blinding instant of passion alone, passion, free, unashamed, irresistible. That is the only gate by which we can escape from the misery of what slaves call life. Is not this the language of your own youth that I heard so often from you in the very place where we are sitting now? Have you changed? To him, these are the only values that are truly real. And he thinks that in a very cruel world that everything comes subsequent to passion and to human desire. Morality is something that should be shaped by passion, not being conflict with it. Passion is intrinsically related to happiness and bravery, and in pursuit of his passion, Robert is willing to forsake his friendship with Richard. To further enforce this point, Robert says to Bertha in Act 3, I am sure that no law made by man is sacred before the impulses of passion. Who made us for one only? It is a crime against our own being if we are so. There is no law before impulse. Laws are for slaves. Bertha, say my name. Let me hear your voice say it, softly. Regarding the duplicitous nature of Robert, Joyce himself says in the Notes of Exiles, The sadism of Robert's character, his wish to inflict cruelty as a necessary part of sensual pleasure, is apparent only or chiefly in his dealings with women towards whom he is unceasingly attractive because he is unceasingly aggressive. Towards men, however, he is meek and humble of heart. Act 3 starts with Robert and Bertha speaking vaguely of the night they had together, although no specifics as to what happened was mentioned. They describe their night as a dream, but also as a sacred night of love. Robert writes an excellent review for Richard's book, and when he confronts Richard over what happened the night before, he states that, well, nothing happened, and that Bertha remained loyal to him. But either way, Robert feels like he needs to leave Ireland, and following Richard's original path, departs for Ireland to the mainland of Europe. Despite the testimonies of both Robert and Bertha that nothing happened between them the night before, and the fact that Robert is seemingly leaving Ireland for good, Richard isn't satisfied with this. He and subsequently slumped into a depression, thinking about what Robert and Bertha could have done. Bertha proclaims that she only loves Richard, but this does nothing to heal him, and he says that he has a, he has a wound on his soul which will never be healed. And the play ends with the two of them together, however, and mutual states of depression and in isolation. 
these are pretty obvious parallels to Doll's House as well, where as it ends with a very sliver of hope for the relationship, but among the societal norms, among the, you know, complicated history between the characters, and just all these factors working against them, this this very big sliver of hope is almost comical in how unlikely it is to amount to anything. So to conclude this video on Exiles, we're going to discuss what the meaning of Exiles is in the play. And luckily, Joy specifically tells us what it means in his notes at the end of the play. Why the title Exiles? A nation exacts penance from those who dare to leave her payable on their return. The elder brother and the fable, the prodigal son, and Robert Hand. The father took the side of the prodigal. This is probably not the way of the world, certainly not in Ireland. But Jesus' kingdom was not of this world, nor was or is his wisdom. So here we have literal exiles, meaning Richard and Bertha's desire to leave Ireland for an extended period of time for Richard's, you know, creative freedom. We have Robert's exile as well, as he's like literally shut out of this relationship between Bertha, which is what he desires. And you have him at the end deciding to leave Ireland in his own exile, self-imposed exile, perhaps as punishment for betraying Richard or for not getting what he wanted from Bertha. It's uh, well, it's ambiguous. I don't really know. And you have like the, the psychological exile as well, where Richard is very separate from everything else. He's always upstairs writing. Robert is very exiled in his own pursuits. He's willing to, you know, go against morality, or at least willing to break friendships in order to get what he wants. So there's a very, very mental exile there as well. And Bertha feels very exiled in the sense that she's not getting what she wants out of Richard. She wants Richard to tell her what to do to uphold some sort of sanctity in their relationship, but hold to uphold some sort of sanctity in their relationship, but she does not get it. So just exiles, exile and all about and exiles, if you can believe it. Just to go a little bit into my thoughts on the play as I wrap this up, I think it is good. I don't think it's as good as Portrait of the Arts as a young man, but upon doing this review and this, you know, analysis, I've come to appreciate it more. I don't think this is as good as Doll's House, and there are some kind of melodramatic elements that were a little bit of a slog to read at times, but if you like Joyce, I would highly recommend this as well, because I still ultimately enjoyed it. Joyce described this play as a cat and mouse with three acts, and it's like a literal cat and mouse because people are constantly going to the garden to hide while other characters talk, and that sort of element was kind of weird to me. Just the, like the fact that like grown men are like hiding in gardens to not talk to anyone else, it was a little weird. I can't, it, you know, when you're in a play, you kind of have to like make these weird compromises, but some of that stuff is kind of different for me. But I think this is a word, the sequel of the sort to Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. And if you want to read it, um, I would, you know, say go for it, because it's not that long either. And I think there is a lot to enjoy out of it. I got my most enjoyment, honestly, out of the notes at the end of Exiles. I think of that stuff where it's just Joyce basically like, explaining what he was thinking while writing the play. That stuff is really fascinating to me. But our next stop on the road to Ulysses is a piece that people probably are not familiar with. At least I was not familiar with this until one day I went to a thrift bookstore and discovered Giacomo Joyce. I do not really know what this is, and I suspect that maybe my audience doesn't know what this is either, but it is a lost manuscript of something that he has written, and I am very excited to go into this next because I'm basically going in completely blind, so we will see. And in the next episode of On the Road to Ulysses, we will explore just what the hell is Giacomo Joyce. Thank you so much for watching this video. Check out my other videos, check out my portrait video, and check out my introduction to the Road to Ulysses series if you want to get a better idea of what the series is about. And yeah, so Giacomo Joyce is next, followed by Dubliners, and then followed by Ulysses, so get real excited for that. And check out my friends' channels, Grunzo and colorless wonderland they have some very good videos as well which you can check out colorless wonderland is just a factory making making videos like it's a, like a like it's a factory job Con tons tons of content not so much with Drunzo, um but he is on film fraud so if you want to watch more Drunzo videos you gotta watch film fraud he did episode 93 which at this point tyler is probably published we will see he says he's gonna publish it last night but it wasn't published so I have very little faith. <laughs> it's probably going to be published by the time I get this video done, but whatever, you know. Gotta get the roasting. What's the point of life if you can't roast, you know? 
And <laughs> so yeah, that concludes my video. Let me know what you think. And let me know if you've read Exiles and what you thought of it, because I'm interested. And Andrew's work in general. So that's it from me. Thank you and goodbye.